Hey there, everyone. So I wanted to do a short lecture on the 14th plateau from Jeudeleuze and Félix Quattari's A Thousand Plateaus. This is titled 1440, The Smooth and the Striated. Now, this penultimate plateau is building upon some of the themes that they've been focused on throughout the work. And we can really link this to the kind of subtitle of this entire two-work series, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. And they're trying to draw out probably a very strange distinction in terms of models that probably isn't immediately apparent, which is that for Deleuze and Guattari, they want to talk about ontology or metaphysics or just reality in general as being concerned with functions. One of the important things that they're trying to dispel with is the notion that there is a pre-social form of forms. That, for example, a table just exists all on its own naively. In fact, they want to point out the fact that everything is defined by an instantaneous rate of change. That our notions of being or existence are tied up in an irrevocable tendency to interact. And thus, when we talk about things like tables, for example, they don't want to assume that a table is just a thing on its own, independent of, for example, cultural practices that decide how do we usually build tables? What are the tendencies of various matters that make us consider it a table? Because, of course, there's a difference between a table and a chair. Even though they both share certain characteristics, such as they both have legs, they both have some flat surface, but of course there are variations and differences that make one different from the other. And we can think about the ways in which, throughout this work, they've been looking at the ways in which, for example, art or music will kind of blur these lines. And they want to make a distinction between two different large modes of action, which are both creative and both aim to establish new territory via deterritorialization. It's a very key concept in Deleuze and Guattari's work. And these two modes are, of course, capitalism and schizophrenia. And capitalism is defined by surpassing all of these different territories, right? It's always trying to colonize some new area or enter into a previously unknown market and establish some surplus value such that profit can be extracted. But it's always going to do this in the name of an abstract axiomatic, which is capital. This impetus that compels markets to expand, become more and more exploitative, become more and more isomorphic. So capitalism is really defined by this despotic signifier. And they talk a lot more about this in Anti-Oedipus, and it's one of the first lectures I did on Deleuze and Guattari. But this is essentially an abstract quality of movement, which is going to establish what it means to move in a capitalistic way. Now, they think this leads to some pretty detrimental consequences, like they pointed out in Apparatus of Cap Capture, where this is basically going to lead to a sort of warlike tendency towards war for the sake of war. Conflict is incited for conflict's sake, and it leads to all sorts of nasty consequences because we're always trying to surpass the limits of any market or any material, for example. And as opposed to this, which is going to lead to some very nasty and deadly consequences, they want to point to schizophrenia as a model, which you're like, what? what? That just seems stupid. And the point that should be made is that they're not valorizing mental illness. 
they're not treating schizophrenia as a clinical entity, but rather they're highlighting the fact that the schizophrenic is partic particularly apt to tarry with the things it has been given like a nomad in a territory. It has certain feelings or affects or ideas that approach it, and it has almost a radical acceptance of the things which it is given. It doesn't need to abstract away, but rather it makes everything strictly imminent. Everything is a conspiracy, or it is immediately pertinent to the situation and threatening one's very livelihood. Deleuze and Guattari mention in Anti-Oedipus, for example, um, several different schizophrenics who, for example, Judge Schraber is connecting God to like an an anal property, like the, the solar anus of God and all this. It's very eclectic sorts of collections of things. But the point is that even God becomes something imminent, something um, to do with the function of defecating. It's like this melding of opposite extremes into this force which Deleuze and Guattari see as properly creative. And they don't want us to replicate this notion of mental illness because, of course, they mention that um, schizophrenia itself can, of course, lead to these very abstract lines of death that capitalism follows to, that it can lead one into all sorts of negative practices which will lead to suicide or severe impairment. So they want us to approach this in more of an abstract way of movement. And metaphysically speaking, they want to talk about these two tendencies as basically being functional capacities of two different types of space, smooth space and striated space. They say smooth space and striated space, nomad space and sedentary space, the space in which the war machine develops and the space instituted by the state apparatus are not of the same nature. So they're pointing out these two different types of space in which things interact, because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to come up with some kind of framework for um, thinking about a functionalist, pragmatic form of ontology. So it's concerned with material, real things. It's concerned with the interaction between things. And they're essentially drawing here the line between smooth space or nomad space or the schizophrenic, and on the other end, striated space or the sedentary space or the state apparatus or capitalism. And these smooth spaces or these nomad spaces, it's defined by a sort of um, things have not yet been decided and there's this burgeoning possibility for creativity and there are indeed elements that present themselves. You have I mean, take the nomad, for example. You have things like geographic pressures or the pressure of weather or, you know, like maybe it's some kind of erosion of a plateau that forces one to recede back. All of these are done with a very sober contact with the world rather than an abstraction away. Whereas the striated space or the sedentary space or the state apparatus or capital is founded on this abstract notion of the despotic signifier. It's this transcendent order which is structuring space into very definite ways of being which are not strictly defined by um, these material conditions that are ahead of it. It's like a, a despot coming into a land and laying down his laws, irrespective of the laws of the citizens that are already there. It's a law with a capital L, as opposed to a bunch of different little laws. And this is what Dodos and Guattari want to emphasize, is that the universe is not defined by one law, but rather by a bunch of different little laws. This imminent process of change, um, instantaneous rate of change, like I mentioned before, and this is going to allow for a sort of burgeoning possibility of change. And they say, 
No sooner have we done that than we must remind ourselves that the two spaces, in fact, exist only in mixture. Smooth space is constantly being translated, transversed, into a striated space. Striated space is constantly being reversed, returned to a smooth space. So really, they're looking at these two modes as not strictly separate, but in fact, they require each other in order to exist. This smooth space, or the nomad, is essentially defined by a non-reducible form of movement. It's just pure tendency. Whereas the striated space, or the sedentary space, or the state, this is defined by a, a formalization, a slowing down, a mitigation of change. Right? Think about how states tend to conserve. They tend to be focused around kind of a mythos of the country. You know, you've got your founding fathers, you've got Paul Revere, um, you've got Daniel Boone. And this sort of, it creates like a civic religion almost. Nietzsche talks about this uh, in On the New Idol in Thus Book Zarathustra. He talks about how the state becomes a sort of idol and it almost becomes a, like a pseudo-religious practice of um, conserving the ways things have always been. But Deleuze and Guattari want to mention and make very explicit that these two modes of action and modes of tendency or function are strictly necessary to one another. And to end off this rather short lecture, I want to point out something that seems very strange, which is they want to talk about the mode of action of embroidery and patchwork. You're like, what What the heck does that have to do? I'll just read this um, this short little section here. A more significant distinction would be between embroidery, with its central theme or motif, and patchwork, with its piece-by-piece -piece construction, its infinite, successive additions of fabric. Of course, embroidery's variables and constants, fixed and mobile elements, may be of extraordinary complexity. Patchwork, for its part, may display equivalents to themes, symmetries, and resonance that approximate it to embroidery. But the fact remains that its space is not at all constituted in the same way. There is no center. Its basic motif, quote-unquote block, is composed of a single element. The recurrence of this element frees uniquely rhythmic values distinct from the harmonies of embroidery, in particular in crazy patchwork, which fits together pieces of varying size, shape, and color, and plays on the texture of the fabrics. So here, embroidery is defined, if we think about embroidery, of course, you have a fixed fabric that's already there. You have a space that has already been delim delimited as your workspace, right? And you embroider patterns on top of it to accentuate a function that that thing ought to do. Is it decorative? Is it to be used for warmth? Is it to be some sort of family heirloom? When we contrast this to patchwork, patchwork doesn't have this space in advance. An integral part of patchwork is that the very art is defined by the creation of space itself. So they mention that embroidery, you know, you can have all sorts of constants and variables. I mean, you might have um, very sharp angles at one area, and you might have very smooth um, angles on the other. But nevertheless, embroidery is defined by this very delimited space of the full picture, um, the piece of art. And therefore, it's centralized around themes. Maybe this is the theme of a landscape. So you've got flowers and you've got rocks and all this stuff being embroidered on a surface. And it kind of starts to create a, an axiomatic piece of artwork. It's centered around themes. It can be seen as a sort of teleological way 
of doing art, which is to say it has a purpose, it has an end goal. And that goal is known from the beginning of, oh, I'm going to make this for my mom, and I'm going to make this to suit such and such particular function. And, I mean, really, you think about the fact that you embroider upon a material you've already been given, which is, you know, maybe it's wool, so it has a particular function in your society. It's, like, it's used for covering up with, and... Like, maybe to use something wool as decorative would be out of place. I'm not really exactly sure, but hopefully the point is getting across. So, really, you kind of already have some delimited paths made out in advance. And even if some rules will be broken, nevertheless, there's sort of a general archaeology of embroidery, of how it works. Now, compare this to patchwork. And... They're building here on a theme they did a lot in Antiedipus, which is that of and, and, and to the nth degree. Patchwork is defined by having these basic motifs, these blocks, these little squares, and they repeat themselves, but always with variation. So you've got this fundamental block, just like molecules in physics, and this acts as sort of a point of departure when you start and you've got one patch and then you've got two patches and then you've got four patches and they have certain relations to each other. But you're always, again, building this space and you're essentially using a numeric way of building instead of a metric way of building, which is to say um, in music, you have a definite meter in which your piece plays out, at least typically and kind of traditionally. Whereas in a numeric form of music, you're more focused on uh, how fast is the tempo increasing or decreasing, or how many instruments or, are playing, or um, what becoming is this music engaged in, basically. So we can see that this idea of patchwork, it has more intensive variability built into it. In fact, it's defined by this variability. And this sequential addition, this and, 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 there's a much more open possibility of how exactly do I construct this space. And in fact, this space does not pre-exist. It is something constructed. It is something that is always in the action and always outstanding. And in this sense, it is non-teleological. It doesn't have necessarily a set end or purpose. You can create a quilt which is specifically tailored to the conditions of, well, I want this to be something I can cover up with, but I also want it to look really good, and you can basically construct your material in a lot more fine-tuned of a way. And this is going to highlight the difference between the sort of quote-unquote creative capacities of capitalism versus those of schizophrenia. One is working with a general theme or an axiom, which is kind of defining your limits and your ways of acting, whereas patchwork or schizophrenia, it deals on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and it's this constant addition of, oh, there's a, there's a new, I mean, for the schizophrenic, there's a new conspiracy theory yesterday as there was the day before, and tomorrow there will be a new one, and it's just always focused on this direct sort of contact. So again, I want to emphasize, they're not valorizing mental illness as such, and they're not advocating us to become mentally ill. But they merely want to use this smooth space, which is created by schizophrenia or the art of patchwork, and use this to talk about creative action, of how can we create these spaces and link the method of function to the space which results, to not consider something as having just existed here on its own, like just the bare table, but rather think of it as a product of its interactions with various other flows of energy, of water, of material, whatever it may be. And I think this is a really good way of 
summarizing some of the key aspects of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy, because we haven't gotten too into the woods ontologically speaking, but we can kind of get a general sense of the sort of um, nomos that they want. Nomos, I mean, is motion in Greek. They're asking us to act, to do things, not merely to abstract, but to be engaged with the world in a properly Nietzschean sense. So I hope this has given you some help. I hope you'll consider reading this work and checking out some of my other lectures. Please leave constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments below, and I'll see you in another lecture.